Talk soon. Okay, this is the first WebRTC Working Group meeting of 2022. Welcome. Uh, a little bit about the IPR policy. We abide by it. Uh, W3C patent policy and only people and companies listed on that webpage are allowed to make substantive contributions. Um, we today will cover WebRTC and the use cases, uh, media capture transform, a little bit of encoded transform and capture handle. Uh, the next meetings are on February 15th and March 15th, uh, both at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific. The February will be 90 minutes and the March will be 120. Okay, uh, we have the slides, uh, have been published on the wiki. We do need a scribe to write down the decisions that we make. Do we have a volunteer? So I can scribe after the first section, but I think it'd be tricky in the, um, right. for the first half hour. I'm happy to take care of the first session. Okay, thank you very much, Dom. Okay, great. All right, a little bit about the code of conduct. We do operate under it and we're all passionate, but let's keep it cordial and professional. Uh, we are using the plus Q and minus Q in the Google Meet chat to get into and out of the speaker queue if we to manage the queue. Um, you know, please also use headphones, tell us who you are, so we can keep that in the minutes. I don't think we'll have polls uh, today. So understanding the document status, uh, just because something's in a repo doesn't mean it's been adopted. Uh, we need a call for adoption. We'll talk about some of those. Uh, and the editor's drafts don't represent working group consensus, but the working group drafts generally do. OK, so here's a summary of some of the recent calls for adoption and calls for consensus. Uh, we had a CFC on whoever to see the use cases that concluded on December 13th. Um, we had a discussion at the December 21 interim. Uh, Tim submitted a PR, which we merged to address some of the feedback. Um, we're going to talk more about that today um, and hopefully uh, get a little bit closer to convergence. We had a CFA on region capture, which concluded on December 13th. And the spec is now in the W3C uh, archive. So we're done with that. Uh, we will talk a little bit about a CFC on PR125, which was for WebRTC and Coda Transform for a keyframe API. We'll talk more about that. Uh, there was some concern about race conditions and syncing. Um, and then we have a CFC on intent to discontinue media capture death extensions, which are will conclude on the 26th, so it's not done yet. Uh, please express your opinion. I think I saw one or two more opinions come in. Uh, but uh, please uh, send us your thoughts on that. All right, so here's the uh, agenda for today. We're gonna go to Tim and Keegan on WebRC and the use cases, and then Harold will talk about media capture transform. I'll just have this item about uh, encoded transform, and then uh, we'll turn it over to a lot for capture handle. All right, Tim and Keegan. So yeah, and um, just very briefly, um, I updated the NV use cases um, with a pull request, which has now been merged. Um, it's, I've tried to reflect the thing. I would very much appreciate it if people could go in and um, and look at those those the language that I've tightened up, make further suggestions, um, and I've removed the requirements. And some of them, I think, will end up with new requirements that reflect the the discussion that we had. Um, but for the moment, there's a couple of placeholders in there. So yeah, basically, if you can go in and, and look at that uh, PR comment on it, I'd really appreciate it. And then the other thing that we kind of talked about last time was like, what did decentralized messaging mean? What did we need? What did the people who were trying to do that need? And we came to the conclusion that none of us really knew, but we thought there was maybe something there. Um, and that it, understanding what the uh, minimal acceptable changes were was kind of the thing that we didn't really have a grasp on. So um, I invited Keegan to come and give us some expert opinions, having given that he's basically tried to do this and um, encountered whatever the problems are. So um, basically, I, I'd like to put most of this time to 
through Keegan's um, experience and then um, a discussion around what we maybe have learned from it and what we could potentially put into the document. So, and, and huge thanks to him for, for, um, for agreeing to come and um, spend some time helping us. So um, over to Keegan. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Keegan. I'm a software engineer working at Matrix. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of uh, background on Matrix first to provide some context, uh, and then go into more detail about our use case with WebRTC and service workers. Um, so Matrix is an open source project for secure decentralized communication. The Matrix.org Foundation maintains a protocol uh, specification similar to the HTML living standard, um, along with client and server implementations available on GitHub. The network is federated and has similarities with email and XMPP. Um, voice and video messaging um, in browser uses WebRTC already, um, and Matrix handles the signaling layer for that. Um, so one of the problems Matrix has is that it's trying to be decentralized. Um, in practice, most users will actually sign up to one or two main servers, for example, matrix.org, matrix uh, that main server, resulting in a more centralized network than we would like. So one of our goals is to instead allow users to kind of automatically sign up onto the network just by visiting a website and effectively making the service peer-to-peer. -peer. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so some early browser experiments um, with peer-to-peer -peer matrix was done in 2020. Um, our core idea was to compile a matrix server down to WebAssembly and then run it in a worker, um, a worker thread in the browser. We weren't the first people to try to do peer-to-peer -peer stuff in browsers before, so we made use of Protocol Labs' uh, libp2p set of libraries, which is also used in services like IPFS. Um, we wanted to make use of WebRTC, as it allows direct peerings without an intermediate server other than for signaling. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get WebRTC working in service workers, so we ended up using WebSockets to a relay server. Uh, which not only handled signaling, but also handled all the data packets. So no data went directly between the browsers, uh, which isn't very peer to peer at all, because if the relay server dies, then uh, any existing sessions can't exchange messages at all. But it's the best that we could do at that time. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, in 2021, we made our own overlay network protocol called Pinecone, which works in a range of devices um, over a range of transports, including Bluetooth and WebSockets. Um, we're currently limited in terms of which peer connections can be established from a browser, as we can only really speak to directly addressable nodes. Uh, in this example, it's dendrite.matrix.org. Uh, so we can't direct, speak directly to the iPhone and Android nodes in this graph uh, from the browser because of lack of WebRTC support in, in workers. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so we have a few requirements for any potential solution <clears throat> that's going to work for us. We need to run the server in a, a worker, be it web or service, as we do a lot of compute heavy tasks, which would affect the UI otherwise. Um, we'd like workers to live as long as reasonably possible, as having the server alive longer results in less network churn and creates a more stable peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, we need to intercept fetch requests from the browser as these matrix clients <clears throat> don't actually know they are going peer to peer um, because the client server API um, is identical. So this was the main reason why we went with the service workers in the first place. It wasn't because um, of the service worker lifecycle, how it can live outside the lifetime of a tab. Um, a robust peer to peer network needs the possibility to connect to a wide variety of nodes. Um, because otherwise it can become more susceptible to eclipse attacks where an attacker can control all the nodes that the victim can talk to on the network and therefore uh, manipulate the victim's view of the network. Um, for this reason, it would be preferable to expose the WebRTC connection and not just a data channel to workers. So Pinecone can communicate with whichever nodes it wants to, basically. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So to clarify a few things, um, we don't have any desire to run a long-lived process on a user's browser. Um, we see this as an anti-goal and a privacy invasion. Um, in our experiments with service workers, there are a few inconsistencies between browsers anyway on how long the service worker lifecycle is. So in Firefox, it seems to terminate service workers after 30 seconds of inactivity, where you're not intercepting any fetch requests. 
um, and Chrome keeps the service worker alive for much longer, um, possibly until memory pressure, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but uh, in addition, we can't really use Fetch as an alternative to actual WebRTC as we need the ability to discover and communicate with nodes on the local network. Um, and final slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, so that hopefully gives a, enough context to understand our specific use case and the proposals listed here. Um, I think the most acceptable proposal is probably B or C, um, though I'm not sure if this committee has the remit to support intercepting fetch requests and web workers or anything like that. Um, I don't know how difficult it is to allow web workers to create WebRTC connections. I envisage that the lifetime of the connection is still tied to the lifetime of the tab, but effectively now the WebRTC APIs would, would need to be thread safe as the public API can be called from the main window and web workers simultaneously. Um, and if and when changes are made, we'll probably use um, off-the-shelf libraries provided by the P2P. Uh, just to try it out and verify that our use case has been handled and that's that's basically about it um, so we've had proposals to do rtc data channel and workers and also peer connection and workers mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if either of those would be something useful to you. Yes. So, so that's effectively proposals C and D, um, right. effectively where workers can can make web RCC connections or control the control data channels. Um, making uh, new connections would be preferable. Um, but yeah, something along those lines would would work. It'd still be a little bit messy, um, but it would be tractable at that point. Are there any additional requirements you have for ICE, or, or can you live with the uh, stuff that we already have? I think we can live with the stuff that you that's already there um, at present. All right, so uh, questions? I, I think I'm on first on the queue. Uh, so I'll ask my question. Uh, did you consider shared workers? Um, no, I haven't considered shared workers. Um, are they similar to web workers in this regard? But well, there's uh, web workers. Most people think of a dedicated worker, which mm -hmm. is a uh, scope to one page. A shared worker, uh, and I'm not an expert either. I just learned of them recently myself. Uh, my my understanding is that they allow you to share uh, between multiple tabs without becoming a uh, full fledged uh, service worker. I mean, you cannot. I'm being recorded now, so I would guess that a uh, shared worker cannot outlive the last tab, but I'm actually not certain about that. So it okay, seems I mean, like a better suited uh, area that might remove some of the concerns with um, service workers. Yeah, but I mean, that certainly would sound pretty good, pretty useful for us, because obviously it's it's not ideal if you have three tabs open and they're all running these servers on each tab. You're doing a lot of, a lot of computation, uh, three times computation. Whereas if you can just share it all, then that obviously yeah. does help an awful lot. That's good then. So um, just so we don't rely on my interpretation of it, so maybe I'll rephrase it as a question to you. Uh, does your service need to outlast the last tab? Um, no. I mean, it is okay. preferable if it does. Um, but we you know we understand that you know it's unreasonable to to ask that um, because partly because service workers are not really visible to uh, to end users. So. The end user can't really consent, right? Mm, right. So it would be useful, but not necessary. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Uh, Jim, I think you're on the queue. Yeah, just to try and clarify in, in my mind so that the only real goal, the only reason why you would want data channels in service workers is to be able to intercept fetch. And that's just so that the client doesn't doesn't have to be changed to support that to have running a local service it's not that it would be impossible to do what you want it's just that it makes the code tidier yeah and it partly because also it's the ecosystem in which matrix exists right because um by all means you know we could modify our own sdks at a shim layer so it does like a post message instead of calling fetch and you know post a message to the service worker but that would only then work for that sdk it's not going to be like a 
a more general kind of solution and it's going to be quite invasive for anyone else then to want to add in support for for similar kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, capabilities so it would probably affect uptake um, in terms of how many clients would support peer-to-peer -peer. you say you could patch it but that assumes that that there aren't fetches that are being done by the user agent rather than in JavaScript. So like, you know, fetches for um, CSS or something that was actually in the page, uh, service workers will intercept them as well. So, yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, you can obviously monkey patch the JavaScript to do whatever you want. But like, I, I suppose what I'm trying to get to is, are there things where the resources of the page would be things that you would want to try and intercept and serve over the peer-to-peer -peer network? Not really. Um, most of these things tend to be huge single page web apps, right? So most of the time we're, we're mainly interested in the intercepting JavaScript based fetch requests, as opposed to things like um, CSS and HTML from uh, that the browser initiates. Okay. Thanks. All right, and just to, uh... Uh, what I said earlier about shared workers, I need to go and look up if, to see if uh, intercepting fetch it might be one of the things that's unique to service workers or not, or whether shared workers also offers that. No, it's it's specific to service worker. And that's what that's one reason right. why service worker is even based, while shared worker lifetime is very precise and mm -hmm. is tied to uh, the pages that are related, that are instantiating the shared worker. All right, thank you. So then you're asked then, um, you said you could, uh, so for this particular application, then it sounded like you would be okay with uh, uh, intercepting those by overriding it in JavaScript libraries, or is that not ideal either? I mean, that, that wouldn't be ideal because it would probably affect uptake on terms of how easy it is to add peer-to-peer -peer support, um, you know, having to tell the world, okay, you need to replace all instances of fetch with this custom blob. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is much more difficult than saying just shove a service worker in and it just magically kind of happens. One possibility so. would be uh, to create a peer connection in shared worker. Then you, you would transfer the data channel to the service worker and the service worker will intercept fetch and will, will use the data channel to actually fuel uh, the fetch event response. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds pretty, pretty nice if that, that can work, yeah. I like that. Okay, yeah, if we could get that in the notes, that would be helpful. So, what's so just our... to make sure, sorry, sorry, just to make sure I captured correctly UN's proposal. So it's creating a peer connection in your shared worker, transfer it to a service worker, which would then intercept the fetch. Is that, uh, is that either it? that or just transfer the data channel. It's up okay. to because transferring the whole peer connection is probably a lot more effort than just the data channel. Are we saying that we want to make them transferable to like basically any worker and that service workers just happen to be one of them or, or is there some special uh, behavior that service workers would, would acquire in this? I mean, is there, are they in some way a special case? Um, there's already channels. there's al already a proposal for making data channel transferable. Um, the proposal is to make them transferable everywhere, and I guess the new requirement would be to be able to create to instantiate a peer connection in any worker, meaning shared worker, dedicated worker, uh, and service worker maybe as well. Well, uh, and I think uh, what. The UN suggested just now, I interpreted as uh, we could instantiate peer connections in shared workers and not allow instantiation in service workers, but that instead you can transfer to service workers if you wanted to intercept fetch. Yeah, I, so, I mean, so conservatively, in, yeah. In general, you, you want long, life, long lived objects like peer connection in stable context, and service worker is not really a, a stable context, but still. I mean, there's no harm in exposing it a peer connection in service worker either. Uh, because if you're exposing it to a worker, 
it means your implementation is ready to, to expose it in service worker as well. So. Well, I mean, I, users might be concerned to learn that uh, it can, the browser can instantiate peer to peer connections even without opening a tab. And that, that the site code can do that. Well, Maybe. it's already the case with yeah. Fetch. So uh, it is to servers. A, yeah. service, a service worker that is running without a tab is a really evil thing. And it's, and it's only happening in very specific cases and uh, which, which we try to reduce as much as possible. And I don't think WebRTC will cause much more harm than just fetch, but maybe I'm wrong. So that's so something it, we should discuss. Is there a permissions model for, so for, uh, for the class as a worker? I mean, could you use some kind of uh, permission to say this worker is allowed to I'm starting a worker and it's allowed to do WebRTC and it, or it, it's so not. The, the current model is not really like that. Um, so there's a service worker can be created to um, process push messages, for instance. And you, you have a, a push message API that is usually uh, behind a prompt. So you will be prompted to say, hey, do you want this uh, website to uh, push you messages? And in that case, from time to time, you will receive push messages and service worker will be uh, running in the background without you uh, being able to notice it. Um, so that's one case where uh, service worker can run without a page. So does that mean that in this new scenario, you'd, you'd be able to send a push message which would then start a service worker which would then start a peer connection, which would then start a data channel and set off a, um, you know, updating the state of your message database or whatever? Um, I would say that in, in general, uh, we are reluctant to uh, have push messages triggering some JavaScript without uh, a user visible uh, uh, action. So if a service worker is not notifying the user with some uh, notifications, then a uh, browser will say, hmm, there's something fishy there. So they might throttle your push messages. They might even stop sending push messages because uh, if you're able just for a push message to trigger some arbitrary code in a, in, a, in a device, that's a really bad thing. So that's why it's really respected in terms of security. Uh, ben, you're on the queue. Yeah, I just had a question about um... Data channels and service workers. Is it possible to uh, keep the data channel around for more than one request in a service worker? That's that's a good point. <laughs> it really depends on if each browser, because each browser might kill the service worker or not, uh, with some heuristics that are not uh, shared currently. And if you and the service worker, then you will end the data channel uh, in practice. So you will need to recreate one, which is bad. That's true. To clarify, uh, so far we've only specified transfer of uh, data channels to dedicated workers, or are they transferable anywhere? Uh, I think that available anywhere, uh, but and we need to check. Well, uh, data channels don't have constructors, so uh, the only way to get a data channel is to is to get uh, to have a peer connection. And uh, so far, we haven't uh, specified transferability either of uh, data channels or or of peer uh, connections. We, we we have in WebRTC extensions, and currently okay, it's so exposed we, in. Okay, so we did that. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, trans it's, transferability is, isn't uh, specific to the type of, of worker, I think. Uh, yeah, we try, we try to not be specific. And currently, it's exposed in, in worker, meaning dedicated worker, shared worker, and service worker. Uh, yeah, I found that link to uh, it's, it's window and worker, which I guess is dedicated worker. Link in chat. Because the, well. So, so I, I guess, guess that's where the interface is exposed. Yeah, sorry. 
No, I was just going to say, as as kind of uh, the person who brought this up, uh, what would be, what do we think the sensible next step is for this? Uh, what can we, I think we've got close to a semi-agreement, but what, what should we be doing next? I think it would be good to file an issue. Uh, it would be good to mention Ben's uh, issue as well as a sub-issue on GitHub because maybe there would be something specific to the touch and all and transfer, or we need to understand this issue a bit more as well. So where, but where would you put that issue? I mean, it, it doesn't, it feels like it's gone beyond um, the use cases document. I would say where see extensions, uh, because that's where we are defining data channel uh, transfer. That's probably where we would say, hey, we're extending peer connection to be uh, created in workers as well. To me, it feels like we should we should be writing an explainer because uh, we got uh, all, all that's needed in spec is probably a little little bit of patching over here and over there, but uh, seeing how it's all supposed to fit together, what we're going to enable, mm. I think I think it would be nice to have to to write an explainer rather than than trying to trying to draft to the monkey patches. So where would you think the explainer lives? I mean, it could be at least some of it could be in in um, in use cases, but maybe that's not the right. Maybe it ends up going to the the wrong level for the use cases. Um, I mean, I, I think I, I'd like a, like to see a document in uh, I mean, probably in extensions uh, because that's uh, just a just a. A markdown file saying that so here's here's a description of the use case for uh, of an implementation of uh, uh, the peer to peer use case and and here are the five changes that are needed in order to make this feasible. Yeah, and, I, uh, I like that. And, and once once we have what and uh, and here's 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 why it all fits together. And once we have that, we can ma migrate it to the main spec when we merge. Uh, uh, extensions into the main spec. So, where does that leave the use case? Because at the moment in the PR, the use case has no. It's a use case, but with no requirements, which, like, yeah, it looks a little weird. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, so so uh, yeah, it's it's a use case, and it turns out to be a use case that can't be done in the current API. So there are some requirements in there. Yeah. But we got to tease them out somehow. Or may, well, or, uh, the requirement might just be make this use case work, and then you have the explainer as the next description of this particular set of extensions makes that use case work. Okay, so so at the moment there's a holding to be decided for the the requirement, and I figure that we're not in a position to put anything concrete there yet. Well, I think you can you. You can make a start um, with some of the things we've been talking about. I mean, it might not be finished, but yeah. My my current feeling of the word explainer is that it's uh, a name for a document for any any text that doesn't belong in the in the requirement and doesn't belong in the spec. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It seems like the we, requirements. We, could we take them? There's we, a slide that said design considerations and constraints. Maybe that could be boiled down to requirements. That's line 16. I'm happy to have a shot at that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have clarity on who might do the explainer bits. Well, let me ask another question then. Who is motivated to make this move forward by doing the experiment bits? Again, I can make a shot of it, but I don't feel like I have enough of either of the either the detail of what's possible or the other side of what's required. I feel like I'm rather in the middle too. But like I say, I can make a shot of it, but it will need um 
input from other people. I'm happy to provide some input, maybe. Cool, thanks. Okay, thank you. Happy, happy to contribute to review and suggestions once we have the start. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I think we're uh, done with this segment. And uh, we can move on to media capture transfer. Harold? Yes. So this is uh, hopefully forma formalities. Uh, but uh, so situation is we have a spec that is adopted by the working group. And so we have, have agreed to work on this on this basis. And the next step formality is the first public working draft publication. And uh, it's an important formality because it's it triggers the licensing requirements thing from the WTC IPR policy. Next slide. So I, re I read up on the, on the process document. We don't have to have a requirement, have consensus on what's in a document. And it does not imply that the WGC endorses this precise solution. What it said is, says that is that it should document outstanding issues so that it's relatively clear that this, these parts uh, are not controversial, these parts are controversial. So should be easy requirements, right? Next slide. So I looked through the open issues and I found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, from going all the way from, uh, is this the right approach to how do we handle video rotation? And now a new one. Uh, sorry, I'm not uh, completely caught up, I see. So next slide. So I made some suggested disposition for it. For them, I suggest we leave uh, issue four open. The question of whether it's the right approach. We should leave that open as a placeholder, so that we can say we'll close this once we have the fixes we need in uh, in, in the stream spec, so that we're completely sure that it's uh, an a, a feasible approach. I suggest that in the warning note about real time, we adopt some variant variation of the suggested text. I didn't get around to writing a pull request in time. And number 23, out uh, of main thread processing. That's documented as an open issue in the spec saying there's no consensus on whether or not it should be available in window. Uh, number 26 uh, had a very generic title of uh, API for tuning a media stream track in internal state. And the discussion had quickly settled on uh, how, do we, how do we mute the track? Well, the video, uh, vid video stream, uh, video track generator has a muted attribute. Thanks to Janivar for providing that uh, API. And so I close the issue. We're done. We have a proposal, proposed solution. Next slide. Uh, whether or not we should do audio, that's documented in spec as an open issue. I think we should, others think we shouldn't. Uh, memory locality is a question about uh, really about reusing our buffers so that we can, can cycle around the buffer pool without uh, ever having to, to rely on garbage collection. So I hold, I, I hold, held that as a document, as a, an issue we need to keep open, but uh, it's kind of exploratory in nature. So we, so, uh, we don't need to answer this before, before going to a public, first public working draft. Uh, 34, relationship to w web GPU, the same kind of uh, issue. 
we have a proposed propo a solution that is proposed in the PR and web codex, which might lead us to to say that okay, this is solved by uh, by um, ways to manipulate video frames and say get it done. But um, again, I don't think this blocks first public working draft. And there's sixty five on video rotation, which I which I, I think is actually a metadata AC on video frame. And I suggest we just move it there. I said, over to the web code spec where video frame lives. And that was the end of the issues. Next slide. So in summary, in my opinion, we don't have any blocking issues that block us from issuing a first public working draft call for consensus. The obvious disagreements are documented, and the other issues are just not important enough. So my proposal is that uh, after this meeting, the chairs issue the CFC for first public working draft. Now, discussion. Jan Ivan, no. you're first in the queue. All right. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I also looked at the issues, and I, I think I agree with most of what you presented there. Actually, uh, I did open an issue seventy-one, <clears throat> which is more of a clarification uh, about uh, what the consensus is or isn't. And uh, so, I did a look over media stream track processor introduction section. Still says, if the track is an audio track, the chunks will be audio data objects. But I think we should strike that and replace it with a note that says there is no consensus on whether or not audio processing should be added based on uh, earlier discussion. So I think with that, I don't see any uh, other uh, yes. problems. Yeah, so that's a, that's a leftover piece of audio. Cool. I, I think they're in the same vein. Uh, the use cases in section one, they identify audio uh, like in, in three of the four use cases that the specification explicitly aims to support, they are based on audio as well. Uh, which, uh, if you just read that, you, you think audio is uh, is supported and this should be clarified as well. Yep, so, so. We do have the note saying that there's no uh, no, no consensus on audio, but we, we, we need to clear out the pieces of audio that are scattered around the document. Right, and also there's an opening for whether audio applies just to video track generator or the, the absence of audio track generator, or if it also means media stream track processor. Uh, and that's, that's, that would be helpful to have that clarification. And it's it's still and bike shedding. I guess we can keep going on, but uh, uh, it's still a little awkward, perhaps, that you have media stream track processor and then you have video track generator. But media stream track is the name of what we're processing, so I think it makes sense. Yeah. It's a bit. Uh, it would be nice if we didn't have to pass in the kind option, make the default value for kind video, for example, small things like that, to make the API yeah, perfect. Actually Actually, media stream track processor takes a track which has a kind. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Pass a, pass a, a kind argument. Never mind. That. So, yeah. so the kind argument uh, went away with the video videos, yeah. the videos stream track uh, generator, video track generator. Isn't there an so issue uh, about media stream track processor being not needed? Because that was one of my feedback at some point, but maybe I forgot to, to file this issue. Uh, you probably didn't, I think. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jan Ivar's proposal was to make the media stream track processor be a track, but uh, the consensus we ended up with as this, in this proposal is that it takes a track. So it's a um, sync. Yeah, I think Jan Ivar's proposal was either uh, a getter or a, a function, right? In the track. Yeah. OK, yeah. I don't think we really have discussed this. Um, or maybe I, 
among them. Well, we, it, it would... we have certainly discussed this since it was uh, one of the one of the biggest differences between Jan Evers' proposal and mine. Okay, well, I'll file an yeah. issue anyway because I, I think it's it's worth uh, discussing because that's one of uh, uh, that's one of the things that might change or uh, at least uh, I still think we, we should try to uh, keep discussing on this. Uh, so, do you think that either seventy one or the issue that UN hasn't filed yet uh, are blocking for the first public working draft? Uh, seven, for me, seventy one. Yes, uh, I'm not sure of the particular. Uh, API shape matters. Hmm. So when you when we so you're saying that you ha we have to strip out the the rest of the reference to audio. That would be good, yeah. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, I'll make I'll make make it a P PR for that, and and then we'll see. And uh, after that, we can issue the first public working draft call. And of course, people can object to the first public working draft after the CFC has gone out. Right. Uh, so, so that's the slide that uh, Bernard currently has on the screen. Yeah. So I think we're largely done with this item. Yep. Uh, and we will issue uh, the CFC uh, shortly. So that was quick. I like quick. Okay, um, go on to uh, just one little item about Web RTC extensions. Uh, we talked about PR 125, which was to add an API to request keyframes uh, that has three APIs, one to generate a keyframe from the script transformer, uh, another one in RTC RTP sender, and then uh, an API to request a keyframe. So um, we had the call for consensus, which ended on January 17th. I think I was maybe me, myself and UN are the only ones who commented. Uh, but the thing that came up was a concern about synchronization. So uh, PR 125 differed from the original Harold's PR uh, 37 in that uh, timestamp is not returned. So there's a question about whether whether that uh, matters. I guess uh, whether there's a situation that you might need the timestamp, I guess, to figure out exactly which keyframe was the one you asked to be generated. Um, the second thing was we were uh, got into a discussion about synchronizing the uh, generation of the keyframe with a key update. So um, typically what happens is you have someone new join the conference and uh, when that happens you need to get them a new keyframe to get them up to date and you may also uh, at the same time you may update the key. Um, and it doesn't help if you uh, encrypt the keyframe with the old key because then the new participant won't be able to uh, decrypt it. Um, and if you send them uh, delta frames, uh, they also won't be able they won't be able to decode them even if they're uh, encoded with the uh, encrypted with the new key. Um, so there's a there's a synchronization issue as well. So I guess the first thing was uh, I'd like to get some opinions from people whether, uh, the timestamp, which isn't in PR125, whether that uh, matters. Do you have an opinion, Harold? Uh, my opinion is that it matters exactly for the case in 127. Oh, okay. When, it's only when for you, that. When you, know that, when you know which keyframe is the one you asked for, you can, uh, you can start applying the transform at that at that, uh, at that point. At that right. Time. Okay. So, so that's the use case for this. Yeah. Yeah. So issue issue one twenty seven is just uh, about uh, VS frame transform. It's not about script transform. So uh, then right. we should well let's think of it as the script transform version of the same use case basically. Well, the, the script transform has uh, the JavaScript has access to every encoded frame, so it has access to whether a frame is uh, a keyframe or not. So yeah, it knows it's a keyframe. Yeah, it doesn't know yeah, it's so, the one so you asked to be generated. So you know it's a keyframe, but what? But but do you know that it's the one you asked for? Right, that you don't know. Yeah, and the, the question is uh, really we 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 need that because in general, what you want to do is uh, you want to apply the new the new key, and you want to apply the new key on the first keyframe that happens. If it happens that you requested a keyframe and it's actually triggering a second 
keyframe, you, you might still want to start on the first keyframe that you receive anyway, to, to start as soon as possible. So the only case where it matters is uh, when you uh, actually uh, want to only apply the encryption at the second frame and not the first frame. And right. for that, we can uh, not, we do not need to update uh, to give a timestamp. What we can do is uh, probably just resolve the promise when the next read will be will be called, and that's what is in in the PR. So uh, I don't yeah, know if that's so, enough, but it should be uh, very close. Well, I did I did want to talk about that specifically, Yuan. So uh, one of the problems for the uh, for the S frame transform, right, was that when by the time the keyframe promise returned, as you said, the corresponding frame may have already been encrypted. So it's kind of the timing isn't guaranteed. Um, so uh, essentially, uh, the, the question is whether you could do something like a promise that all, you know, send the generate keyframe and then uh, the send the transform set encryption key, whether that would work in any of the cases. Um, are you saying it might conceivably work for the uh, sender dot generate keyframe you went? So if you're applying generate keyframe on the sender, uh on RTC RTP sender, then everything is difficult to handle because your main thread while uh, the frames are flowing uh, right. in another process. So it's very difficult there to, 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 to do those things. So that's why in that, in that case, you really need a script transform. And for the script transform, you, you, will, you will be in the same thread. So uh, I'm, I'm probably sure that this will uh, actually, actually work there. Um, you will generate a keyframe, you wait on it, and, and then you apply the uh, encryption key. Hmm. OK. Um, yeah, I guess we'd have to have uh, some kind of guarantee that that would, that that would function. Yeah, uh, I think that what, what would be really good is, is that there, there are some experiments that are done with uh, the current support. Uh, that, that will prove or not whether that's good enough. Uh, there's already support in Safari, so people can uh, try JavaScript and try to use it and, and see whether uh, in terms of uh, resolution that, that will work for them or not. If not, we can certainly uh, try to change the way the time the promise is resolved or the type of the promise if that's really helping. Uh, so for, for script transform, I do not believe we need a, a timestamp. For sender, which is main thread only, uh, we could return timestamp because there you don't have you don't have every frame, so maybe you you could use it, uh, but mm -hmm. I don't know what would be the use for it. So that's why currently it's not returning anything as well. Hi, I put myself on the queue. Uh, I'm sorry for not providing timely feedback on this one, but uh, I did look at the PR and wondered why we had uh, two APIs, one on the sender and also on the transform. But I let it go. But now I see here with a wait promise all, uh, there might be a foot gun here where you would expect the sender generate keyframe to be, able to be able to synchronize that when you should be using the transform version of the API. So then I guess I should ask what is the use case for the method on the sender and do we need both? Um, so I, I think it was an, uh, a request from uh, Microsoft uh, Teams people. Right. So I, I do not have all the details there. Yeah, that, that it one was didn't not related really... to encryption. I yeah, think. it wasn't related to encryption. It was more related to simulcast uh, kind of things where you, right. you might have a new, a new guy en entering the call and you, you might want a keyframe and not wait for the keyframe to happen naturally or for uh, a fear to happen, something like that. Okay, thanks. Okay. And in that case, you, in that specific case, you do not need timestamps. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, I guess we're willing to explore whether we can get promise that all to work uh, and not, uh, my other question was, would we have to go to a single atomic method that kind of did everything at once? And I think at least so far, the answer seems to be, we don't need that, right? Um, so for issue 127, where we interact with S frame transform and generate keyframe, uh, we, we have to do something like if you're setting the key, a new key on the S frame transform, uh, you need to understand whether the S frame transform should ask the keyframe and apply the, the, the new key on 
uh, right. on the on the keyframe. So so we need some parameters, or we need to define some behavior uh, for the SRAM transform. So there's clearly something missing uh, for SRAM transform, uh, and we need to to add support for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you're not saying that uh, we, we need to essentially generate the keyframe and set the encryption key in one method, in a single method, to avoid um, the race. I, I, I would think that the, for the SRAM transform, you would uh, call the set encryption key, and then the SRAM transform right. would, would call a keyframe on its own or would, would do the, its own business, and maybe would provide right. some options. Right. So that JavaScript would be able to fine tune things there. Okay. So yeah, potentially set encryption key might also uh, kind of implicitly call generate keyframe uh, right. to, to roll it over. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, anyway, I think I think we have our uh, potential uh, ways forward on this, um, and I guess we have to work more on the on a PR for to address one twenty seven before uh, merging. Uh, PR 125. Is that um, right? I, I don't. I don't think it's needed because uh, okay. uh, the the PR is uh, adding support for script transform, and right. uh, it, it can be used without this frame transform, and it's providing benefits for the people that okay. are using encryption done in JavaScript. And uh, for shipping as frame transform, I believe we we need to fix issue 127. Okay. All right. Okay. So we can essentially merge merge one twenty five PR one, and then work on this. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to move over and hand this over to Elad. Yes. Hello. How are you doing? Everybody can hear me. Yep. I think I need to refresh the thing. I keep seeing now uh, uh, video artifacts. Hello, I hope it's better. Testing. Testing. Your, you, we can hear your, your video flashes in and out, but uh, I guess the audio is probably... Yeah, so, sorry about that. I, I'm having a, a bit of uh, technical difficulties. Okay, uh, I'll try like this. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be uh, presenting again, again about Capture Handle. And uh, I'm gonna first um, uh, recap a bit uh, about what we've discussed previously. Then I'm going to uh, make um, a proposals for extension of the original API. And then I'm going to, if the crowd is interested, I'm going to discuss a bit why we need both and why the new thing is not enough to uh, um, obviate the old thing. So, uh, First, a recap of or a reminder of the um, premise. So uh, we're assuming that we've got one application that's a, a virtual conferencing application, something like Meet, Zoom, Teams, or we'll just call it VC app. And um, somebody is presenting something uh, in a tab, and you know that tab can be uh, Google Slides or it can be any other application. Let's call it Slides app. And right now, uh, when you uh, when the user chooses what to capture. Uh, the user knows that he is capturing a slide app uh, and that he is capturing one of potentially several sessions uh, of that slide app uh, that he's got open on his uh, browser. But the application, the, the virtual conferencing application does not. And what that leads to is that if the, uh, if the user is watching the uh, virtual conferencing application, he cannot actually interact with the other application that he is presenting so uh, easily. So it would be difficult for the user to change to the next slide, previous slide, uh, and it would be even more difficult to do anything else more robust, like maybe uh, interact with the page, move around the cursor, uh, click on links, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, previously I um, suggested a mechanism that would address this. And one problem with that mechanism was that it assumed that the two applications have set up some kind of collaboration ahead of time. So for example, it would work well for uh, Microsoft Teams and Microsoft um, PowerPoint, and it would work well for Google Meet and Google Slides. And it could even work in conjunction, right? It could be Google Meet and Microsoft, Slide, uh, Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, but they would have to set up this 
uh, this collaboration ahead of time. And, you know, it's kind of difficult to go and uh, set up collaborations with absolutely everybody that's out there. Uh, but if they do set up a collaboration, that mechanism worked. So I will now give an example of the old mechanism in play. Next slide, please. So uh, in this case, we've got a capture so an application that knows that it could potentially be captured, not every single time, but sometimes. So ahead of time, it calls set capture handle config. And there it says exactly what it wants to expose should it be captured. So in this case, we see it says expose origin, true, which means, hey, I am willing to, uh, whoever captures me may discover that, uh, you know, my origin. It sets a handle, which is free flow, uh, uh, free form text, and it can put whatever there. And it's up to whatever is capturing it to know how to parse that and what use to make of it. And then it says, sets permitted origins, uh, which basically is a way to limit who can read that. So if this is for some reason secret, and we can discuss later why it could potentially be, uh, then it could limit. But it is also possible to say everybody can read that, which I expect to be the more common case. Uh, so in this case, um, <clears throat> if uh, we look at mid slides, and, I'm sorry, mid and slides, for example, and then slides could give a session ID. Hey, I'm slide session number one, two, three. And if Meet ever captures it, it knows how to communicate through the Google backend with one, two, three. Next slide, please. So in that example, uh, there is a bit of code here, but most of it is not uh, so interesting. Basically, once you've already got the capture in place, you're going to first, you're going to say, OK, if, uh, if there is a change of capture handle, I need to react to that. But now here is the capture handle that I have. Let's see who that is. And oh, if it happens to be one of the origins that I'm um, ready to, to work with, then I'm just going to use the ID. And you know maybe I'll expose some user facing controls. Next slide, previous slide. And whenever the user presses that, I know that I need to send that to session one, two, three on whatever. Next slide, please. Now, the problem with this mechanism is that, as mentioned, it only works when uh, you're capturing something that you've uh, set up a collaboration with. And sorry, OK, seems an unrelated message. Uh, so in order to address the, um, the other uh, case, uh, I've spoken to Yanivar, who was really concerned that the original mechanism was only uh, useful for collaborating applications, and they wanted something a bit more generic, albeit a little bit less powerful, or at least less flexible. Um, and uh, so I, I split that, we'll call the old thing capture handle identity, and we'll call the new thing capture handle actions. And of course, the names are uh, far from final. Uh, next slide, please. So one. Um, one possible way to go about this is we could say, OK, there are a list of actions uh, that we know that capturing applications and captured applications might actually want to uh, pursue. Uh, first slide, previous slide, next slide, last slide. It doesn't actually have to be a slide, because you could also be capturing something like YouTube uh, and in which or anything that has a playlist. And then those actions could have slightly different meaning. Um, so what you would do is on the capture side, you would declare that you support certain actions. Um, and then you would register a handler or should those actions uh, be fired. Next slide, please. And then on the capture side, you would be able to say, OK, uh, if, I, if I'm not capturing something that I know, and if I'm not capturing something that I've got, uh, that I'm tightly uh, interwoven with, I might still be capturing something that the user uh, understands. And so let's see what kind of actions there are. And if there are actions like, so for example, if I see that the application I'm capturing claims to be supporting previous and next, then I can just expose those buttons in the capturing applications, uh, application. And if the user clicks that, I just send that uh, intent to the other side, right? I say, hey, the user clicked next. I have no idea what that is, but you're probably able to handle that. So if the user co uh, captured YouTube, and then it can just be go to the next thing on the playlist. If the user cap captured Wikipedia, maybe it's next uh, article on some list of articles that you understand. It can be just about anything. <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, 
there is an issue here where basically it could be that you're sending the action exactly as the user is navigating, you know, I'm sorry, exactly as the page is changing, but that kind of thing kind of exists uh, for anything where the user uh, presses something. So I think um, on the one hand, it's not an issue for the actions, but on the other hand, I think that it also uh, shows that if you have anything where you're interested in only sending the message to this particular uh, capture, then uh, with identity, uh, you get around this problem because the communications channel is actually uh, something that you set up out of band. Uh, question, yeah, just a second. That's about to be useful outside of capture. Uh, uh, we, yes. we can look at that later, Elad. I'm just queuing for for later. No worries. Uh, could like, let let's be. Uh, I think that actually now would be a good time because the next applicant. Uh, um, let me see just a second. Yeah, I think my next slide is the one where I basically only if the crowd is interested. So I'm ready for questions. Okay. So I mean, my, my first reaction is that I think this would be providing a very useful feature so like in terms of use case and the particular requirements this would feel uh, i like it uh, i guess it's maybe more a question about uh, whether there are opportunities to make this uh, mechanism useful beyond just the capture capture relationship in particular what you describe about the possibility of a web application exposing its capabilities as a set of uh, keywords or tokens is something that i have seen as being needed uh, in other situations where uh, it's not capture or capture but an iframe within an app where you want for instance to control the youtube player you embed from your uh, top web page um, and I don't want to derail this very specific narrow, uh, or maybe not narrow, but this very specific use case. But I also don't want us to miss uh, an opportunity to achieve uh, a greater bank for the back. So I, I guess I wanted to mention this. In, in particular, in the past, there had been uh, years ago discussions about something called web intents, which uh, was a way for a web app to expose uh, an API for other apps to use. Um, I'm mentioning this more as a keyword for further research more than, a, again, a specific proposal. Uh, understood. And I think that you actually brought to our attention that there is something called media session where something like that does exist. Uh, I'm not sure exactly about whether you can also expose capabilities or not, but this does exist for the not, uh, where, for the case where you don't actually capture. And you uh, mentioned that we might want to piggyback on that. And I would like to ask you, Anne, if there, if he sees any way that we can piggyback on that, because uh, it seems sure. to me like it, at least a cursory glance, did not make it clear to me how we could tie the two things together. Because uh, with uh, media session, as far as I understood, you uh, the application knows immediately that this comes from the user, whereas for the case of capturer and capturee, this doesn't necessarily have to come from the user. It could be that the application is actually exposing user facing controls and typing the user action, but it could also call it uh, of its own accord, and that would be perfectly OK. But the receiving application would want to know the distinction. So from um, a user's perspective, uh, capture capture is, is a bit similar to uh, you on YouTube and you're using a picture in picture to control YouTube while uh, doing some other stuff. And uh, picture in picture uh, is uh, a user interface implemented by the user agent of the OS. Uh, and you have some UI like Next, uh, previous, and you can click on it. And at some point, the JavaScript from uh, YouTube will receive events saying, hey, you, you, need, you need to do something to go, because the user wants to uh, go to, to the next track, for instance. And so the media session defined an API with some actions that are defined like play, pause, uh, stop, uh, next track, and, and so on. And th these are called actions. So it's, it, it seems very similar uh, from this standpoint. From a security point of view, uh, it's very different be because uh, on one end, uh, it's the browser uh, that is sending these events. So you can think of them as trusted. While on the other end, it's the capturer that is that would try to, to send the, these events to the capture. And so uh, you probably need to add 
information like uh, the capture origin, or you need to think about uh, potential security issues there. Uh, but from the definition of the actions uh, and so on, uh, it seems like we, we should be able to uh, reuse as much as possible the, uh, the effort and add additional APIs if we need to. It seems potentially useful for YouTube to be able to say, hey, I'm a media station and uh, PIP is working great. And I'm also allowing the same event handlers uh, plus some security checks to be called by another app if, if we find some uh, get display media being used or some of the APIs in the future that will be able to uh, hook up uh, one page with YouTube. So that, that's why um, I think it's, it's useful to, to, to look at that. Uh, I'm definitely happy uh, looking at that. And if you've got a concrete uh, suggestion, I would love to hear that. But in terms of generally uh, from my own uh, look at that, and maybe I just misunderstood the, your intention, um, it did not look to me to be exactly something that I could piggyback onto uh, for several reasons. One of them already mentioned is the lack of uh, the fact that, um, that I want to allow the application to send the message and not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily need to come from the user. Uh, second is that the actions in media session do not actually map onto the uh, everything that we would want. So some of them are irrelevant or inappropriate, like for example, toggle mic on and off on the captured uh, site does not seem to me like something that we would want. Uh, I also th can Maybe. think of, I can also think of actions that uh, we would want that are not in media session, like page up, page down, because if I'm sharing the document, then that is something I would want. Um, so I think that's a, that's a very good point. There's one thing that we, we need to understand is whether uh, what we are after is like a, a predefined set of actions or what we are after is uh, uh, an application specific set of actions because th this is very this, these are two different uh, use cases. Uh, if what we are after is like a very generic application specific actions, then media session is probably not uh, what we are after. But if what we are after is the classic uh, media session controls kind of thing, then we already have some de definition and there are, or there's already some code. Of course, with this use case, there's a need for additional APIs. For instance, you would need in capture to expose some proxy uh, to the media session. And on the media session side, there's also a need uh, to say, uh, media session, I'm okay receiving uh, orders from this origin or this origin. Uh, so definitely the it, media session is not sufficient, but uh, I think we can probably use that as a foundation. And uh, if time permits, I, I, can, I can try to, to dig further, but um, I think it's good if we can try to, to do this exercise first uh, before trying to uh, define something uh, completely uh, different. Uh, I see that there is a long list of people waiting in queue, so uh, maybe I'll uh, forego answering this right away. Yaniva, you're next. Uh, yeah, so so I would say I, I like this as it's proposed. Uh, I also looked at media session. That has, uh, in particular, I looked at next track, previous track. Uh, and I don't think Google Slides actually responds to next track, previous track. And I could also see a presenter might have a slide with, uh, for instance, YouTube on it, and there is audio, and then it's actually confusing. Um, so I, I definitely think next and previous slide should not be overloaded onto next track and previous track. Um, and even the, the security issues uh, UN mentioned makes me think that these are, uh, we're better off with separate APIs for this, uh, even though there's perhaps some uh, synergy and that we could, uh, in the set action handler, maybe we can have a similar type API. But again, this seems like a separate thing. And um, I think we would be better off treating it as separate from media session. So quick, quick question, Juniva, um, related sure. to my question uh, about like a fixed set of actions, like next slide, previous slide, or mm -hmm. like application specific, like very generic. Uh, what, what's your uh, thought on uh, uh, your thought? I, I, I would like to standardize on just the four or even the two. I would even take two if uh, next slide, previous slide, I think are the, the core uh, features. So, so, so my what, main concern is that uh, this be part of the initial API of capture handle so that there is something for everyone and it so that we have 
um, generic standardized actions and then customizable ID for specific applications. So that do, uh, do you think next, next slide would likely implement both? Do you think that if next slide, previous slide was in media session? Uh, because we, we might talk with these guys and we might say, hey, we are thinking about next slide, previous slide. What do you think? And they might say no, or they might say yes. And if they say yes, then <clears throat> maybe it means there's something that we should put here. Well, I don't see why we couldn't have both and why we couldn't explore both in parallel. Because if you have hardware buttons for next previous slide, you could push those. The user could push those or the uh, the application, the, the BC app could instruct it, which hopefully would also come from the user pushing buttons in the BC app. But of course, there's no guarantee of that. Uh, Harold is next. Uh, I wonder if we're to tackling the relationship between this and the, and the media API uh, mentioned uh, the wrong way around. Because as far as I can tell, LLs proposed this for a more generic interface uh, than uh, the media capture actions. So I would rather, uh, I would perhaps rather uh, investigate whether we can express media capture actions in terms of capture handle actions and merge them that way. But uh, I think that uh, limiting the the language of uh, actions is to a predefined uh, set is going to turn out badly. So I think I think we I think we need user defined actions. That's my opinion. Um, so th the way I see it, and uh, Harold, I would like to hear your opinion, is that if the, um, there can be a relatively small set of actions that are useful in general. And for anything that is user defined, it already requires collaboration because you need both the capture -y to be able to handle it and the capturer to be able to send it. So for that, you need the capture handle identity, where basically they set up some kind of communication channel out of band using the identity, uh, using identity exposure actually, and then it no longer matters. Like you would no longer be using any of the actions at that point. Mm, maybe it, it, it seems that capture needs to understand capture, -y, but maybe in some cases capture -y does not need to understand capture at all. So that, that's why maybe uh, Harold's point might in practice work uh, without capture capture -y to deal with capture. So do you mean that, for example, if Meet were to capture some arbitrary website and see, oh, you've got X, Y, and Z? Even without knowing what it is, it just puts up buttons labeled X, Y, and Z for the user to press? No, no. Google Meet is the capture. So Google yes. Meet would need to understand the capture site. But maybe the capture site does not need uh, to say, oh, it's Google Meet that is sending me this order, so I will do that. Oh, it's no, but... uh, Teams that is sending me this order, so I will do this, you know? No, def definitely not. But it would, be a, it would have to expose those uh, actions and understand them. So if they're user defined, they're, def they're actually defined by the captured website. Um, so I, I'm in the queue, so I'll jump in. Uh, I, I agree with Harold's assessment that the architecture relationship is probably the other way around, media session being a specialization of what uh, capture angle, handle is uh, looking at. Uh, my own suggestion earlier was that it's actually a broader architecture situation of coordination between web apps, which typically would be done through post message today. Um, and again, I sense that it may be a matter of uh, defining a mechanism, a mechanism for uh, declaring that you react to a post message uh, set of commands and maybe having a, a, an easy way for, well, having a way to standardize some of these commands so that uh, you can expect to find them uh, in some context. Um, but again, I like there is this trade-off between finding the best generic solution and uh, fulfilling this specific use case. Uh, I don't think we've quite hit the right uh, 
middle point in that trade-off. Uh, I think it needs more exploration, as has been uh, suggested. But uh, again, that's probably a point where reasonable people can disagree. So. Uh, okay, I'll plus queue myself after uh, Yaniver. Yeah, so uh, I think my main concern with uh, user definable actions is inputting strings and then accidentally creating another uh, message channel, which I really, really want to avoid. Uh, I think having a couple of standardized enums, if you will, and then an ID with the idea you can bootstrap your own back channel using post message and existing technology so that we don't have to create new technology for that. Um, and that, I think that is why as soon as you allow arbitrary strings, you know, people can put megabytes into it. Uh, okay, um, I'll go next. So um, I think that if we can at least uh, agree that, and hopefully uh, I can present about that if necessary, uh, that both the capture handle actions as well as the capture handle identity are both necessary, then maybe we can move forward with capture handle identity and keep capture handle uh, actions under discussion. So um, is there anybody that perhaps is unclear or disagrees with the fact that both are needed? Um, I would, I was in the queue, but I will answer first uh, to Ilad's point. Um, I would put that in terms of priority. Uh, and there's a very clear use case, which seems to maybe be solvable by the simplest, uh, very narrow action uh, uh, approach. So I, I, would, I would call one is P1, the other one is P2 somehow. And uh, maybe we, I, I would tend to push more effort in, uh, in the actions and less effort on uh, capture handle. And ju just about um, the, we, in general, I think we had this, this discussion in the mailing list as well. And some people uh, express the, the same uh, points as Jan Ivar. Uh, st stating that uh, as captures, they would prefer to have like a fixed set of actions because this way they, they feel that they might be able to uh, use uh, more easily Capturey than if Capturey had to uh, run JavaScript uh, specifically on, uh, on captures uh, uh, messages. Because executing JavaScript based on capture uh, uh, input requires some trust, and websites will have difficulties trusting, uh, like uh, a large amount of uh, VC providers. Um, in that case, uh, if I could just, if we could go to the next slide, I think that uh, I'm not sure what UN uh, referred to as P1 and what as P2, but I would like to argue that the capture handle identity is actually the P1. Uh, so if we could go exactly, thank you. Uh, so I just want to explain why identification is necessary, even if we assume that we uh, standardized uh, capture and elections and that, you know, it provides everything that everybody here wanted. Uh, so first of all, is that um, with identification, the identification part, it is, um, sorry, uh, so you're able to do two-way communication. That's number one. Uh, you cannot do that with the actions. Um, number two, and the list here is a bit different. Um, yeah, uh, number one actually was that you would be able to actually send some information from the capture to be the capturer without actually requiring the capturer to send the message and therefore alert the capture to the fact that there is a capture. So if I'm a capturer and I capture something, I can already understand whether I want to start communicating or not without uh, giving that piece of information that you are being captured. Uh, another thing is that we get uh, the ultimate amount of flexibility in messaging, right? Uh, because once you've got the identity, you set up a peer connection, you set up some, you know, shared uh, some communication through uh, REST API or anything of the sort. All of this is possible, and we don't limit ourselves to any kind of model. And it's actually also possible to tie into whatever kind of credential model um, the capture and the capture already share on the backend. Uh, whether certain certain actions are privileged and others are less privileged. Etc. So all of this is immediately possible because you just have no, a normal communications channel between them. And basically, if you think about this, the moment that you've got this communication channel, uh, the capture and the capturee become almost like a single app, as if one was embedded as an iframe by the other. 
And even more interestingly, user agents like Chrome and Edge that have a share this tab instead button, you are actually allowing the user to let the certain things follow you, right? Because the moment you press share this tab instead and you start capturing the other one, there is an event fired that lets the capturer know that, hey, there is another uh, capture handle right now. And it's almost as if the user can control unloading the old iframe and loading a new one in, inside. And these are all things that you don't actually get with actions. Uh, so I would say that if anything, uh, the identification part is the P1. And therefore, I would also like to ask whether we could start work on that and continue with actions, um, you know, out of band. So um, since I didn't answer your first question there, um, I, I see, and I hate to be difficult, but I kind of see the minimum a minimum set of actions of next slide and previous slide as a blocker for identity uh, in order to, because otherwise we can't rebut the notion. Uh, we want to be able to rebut the notion that we're adding APIs specifically for narrow co co collaboration between sites, which I fear will mostly benefit major sites with resources in both the VC app and slides app domains. So, awesome. um, are yeah. such websites illegitimate? Like, is it not legitimate to own both the uh, virtual conferencing application as well as the slides application? They're, of course, they're legitimate and, and highly popular and, and, and excellent, I would say. Uh, the question is whether we don't want to necessarily, when we add general new APIs to the web platform, we also want to make sure that they're beneficial outside of those uh, very popular sites. OK, so, but it is possible for impo uh, unpopular sites to spring up and gain popularity over time. Like, there is nothing here preventing anyone. Sure. I, I think this, I'm uh, rehashing the point that was made by others. Uh, uh, Sergio, I believe, uh, who said this uh, as well, that it'd be better to have an API that uh, you could standardize that would do next previous slides across uh, properties. What, so what's, that's why I would love to see you... it to happen at the same time. But I appreciate the extension be there between taking the time necessary to to um, have a longer set of actions. Sorry, you went away. Yeah, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, I was just uh, about to say that um, generally, when you have a generic mechanism, you need to spend a lot of time because it's very difficult to get it right. So what's appealing about this very small set of previous slide, next slide, is that we can probably make it work, uh, hopefully quite uh, fast, and without uh, getting it wrong. While with a generic mechanism, we, we really need to, to spend a lot of time to uh, check all edge cases and so on. So if it's doing like 80% of uh, the use cases with 10% of uh, the time, then I think it's worth to start with this and uh, do the generic uh, um, approach uh, as a follow-up. Okay, but uh, I believe that capture handle, uh, I don't recall exactly, but I think that it was first uh, introduced, um, first proposed and also implemented in Chrome behind a, an origin trial more than six months ago. So there was plenty of time for issues to be surfaced. And if um, you know Mozilla and Apple had any concerns, we could have hashed them out a long time ago. Um, I think I raised some issues that are still not addressed. Uh, I, for, for instance, the origin and so on. And honestly, it's a generic thing. So we, we on our side, we, we need to spend a lot of time to iron out all the details and to validate that it's, that it's okay. And uh, I think that doing this work, this amount of work, uh, is uh, is more difficult than spending like one or two hours on the very uh, reduced case of next slide per slide. Do you have any kind of uh, estimate of how long this would take? Something that could be noted in the minutes? Uh, I, I don't know, honestly. Um, uh, uh, you are not, you're talking about capture handle identification now, right? So the, the, what the, the, the wider scope of action. Uh, no, I, I'm, 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 yeah, correct. The generic thing is the capture handle, and uh, the narrow thing would be the action 
that will be scoped to next slide for your slide. I'm not talking about the uh, middle action uh, genetic thing. So are you talking about identification? Uh, I'm talking about the capture handle proposal as being the generic and which requires... Uh, uh, in others, try to carefully divide this into two pieces so that we could discuss them with some, with some separation. Are you talking about the identification part or the action part, or both? So I'm not sure to clearly see uh, the difference, but if the action part is the two uh, next slide previous slide, make it work for next slide previous slide. And if identification is the generic approach, yes, that's correct. The identification is a mechanism to identify the capture e to the capture the actions is a mechanism for the capturer to instruct the the capture e to do something these are two conceptually different mechanisms so again oh, okay. are you are you talking about are, are you saying that you want to uh, narrow the scope of the action mechanism or the ident mechanism. Well, there's also um, a part where you have to register your actions. And that is at the same time as you would uh, reveal your identity, right? Not necessarily. That's, uh, that's, that's the part where the two are linked. Yeah. But it's possible to have the identification mechanism completely without the action mechanism. With, and then, yeah. and no mechanism is, of course, the, the simplest possible mechanism. Uh, so, uh, uh, are you seeing a problem with standardizing at this time the identification mechanism? If that's for me or UN, I, I can yeah. answer. I would like them to, I see a problem. I would like to, to marry them in the same API at the same time in the same standard track. Yeah. So, you, so, you, so, so you'd like to marry them, but, uh, but you'd also like to narrow them, narrow the action mechanism. But, you, but at the moment, you don't have a, have a you don't have a, anything that needs to narrow the identification mechanism, right? That's for you, Janiva. Uh, well, I like the slides that Elad uh, presented here, and I have to reboot my memory of capture handle. Uh, I understand there's some other issues where sending events when the when the page is navigated might have some uh, security issues that I haven't fully. Uh, come to peace with yet, but I, I feel like uh, with the uh, next and previous slides that uh, Elad had proposed, it at least addresses my concern uh, for capture handle as a concept and that we can move forward as a concept. And then we can always hash out the details of uh, security issues with navigation. So the reason I'm uh, driving this uh hard is that uh, uh, when we try to decide multiple things at once and uh, set up all what I, I regard as rather arbitrary link linkages between them, the whole set becomes very hard to make forward progress on. So I would like to see if we can detach the issues into pieces where it's clear which parts are relevant to which particular concern. So that's why I'm uh, being loud so, again. Yeah, Th thanks Harold for uh, stating the two, the two parts. That's, that's helpful for discussion. Um, to me, the most difficult part is the identification part. Uh, and that's one where we, we need to, to spend a lot of time and, and do things uh, right. And by scoping precisely the use case, which is, uh, as I understand, next slide, previous slide, and getting it right for the identification part based on that, uh, I'm hoping we can, we can uh, have good discussion and validate the model and, uh, and be as fast as we, as we can on, on that subject. So that, that's why I think it's it's good to provide uh, a good scope there that you that Elad has done, which is which is great. And uh, I would say we use uh, the narrowed 
down scope of actions as the things we want to support for identification and we validate the identification model based on it. Uh, you and I have since checked and it's almost been a year since we started the uh, discussion about identifi identification. So if it's possible for you to uh, fast track discussions there with me so that we could uh, finish that part uh, relatively, uh, you know, within the near future, I think that would be preferable. Sure. Uh, I, I think that there are still issues with origin. For instance, uh, in, initial, you, there's the case where you're saying uh, the capture uh, has to um, provide origin or not. Uh, and there are things like that that we discussed in the past. It hasn't changed for a, a long time and we haven't reached consensus. And that's one well, thing uh, I'd like you, to, to uh, be able to uh, discuss. With. It's, it's not the same thing. Uh, not reaching consensus is not the same thing as you haven't uh, replied to the replies. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the word has to provide origin or not, that doesn't parse. You can't have a has to attach to an or. So uh, just to provide uh, a framework for this additional discussion. So first, I'm hearing we want to solve the use case. Uh, I'm hearing from Yaniva that the narrow use case needs to be driving the uh, discussion, in particular, as UN was suggesting, the identity discussion need to be compared to that narrow use case. So I guess now the question is uh, how and where we want to have the conversation. Right now, Capture Handle is a YCG uh, committee group uh, report. Do we want to start an adoption process or does do we need clear uh, steps preliminary to, to that um, so that we know which issues need to be resolved uh, either before adoption or before, uh, I don't know, FPWD, before agreeing on the scope of the overall project? Uh, before anybody answers, I would just like to also remind everybody that uh, this uh, feature has seen a lot of web developer interest uh, by Zoom, by Microsoft, and Jitsi, Ring Central, etc. And these are only the people that we've reached out to. I'm sure that we could uh, get even more into uh, So I think that uh, the reasonable thing to do would be to adopt and to iterate over the uh, few things where we don't have consensus. Uh, and hopefully at, a, at an increased pace. I, I think I would support that if we can get some uh, uh, commitment to uh, include the minimum actions that a lot proposed. Uh, so although I think the, the two things are quite distinct, uh, as by way of compromise, I'm perfectly willing to do so. And hopefully we could at least uh, start with a, a simple uh, type of minimum actions and not tie it into you know media session. And we can always revisit that decision later. I'm good with that. Um, Yuan, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's hopefully two different spec somehow, uh, but I, I think it's fine to, um, I would keep them as, as two separate items, but it, it's fine to make progress in, in parallel uh, since they, they might be tied uh, in some areas. So would you be okay with a call for adoption on that uh, proposal? Um, uh, probably. I haven't looked at uh, the capture handles uh, spec for quite some time, so uh, we need to refresh my mind on it. But, uh, but, but, but I guess we, we could start the call for adoption as a trigger for everyone to refresh their mind on the specific proposal and whether they have a burning issues they feel need to be Address. Uh, so my real question was not, uh, are you going to say yes to the call for adoption, but uh, do we feel in the rough right space to start the discussion? Uh, I, wish, I think that we, it's good to make progress. So we can, we, uh, going with the call for adoption is, uh, is in, in the path to make progress there. I've got two questions, uh, one to Yaniver and one to Yuan. Uh, so in case uh, 
is it possible for you to maybe uh, bring uh, bring forth a more detailed um, proposal of what you mean with media session, just in case we want to go with that? And if you find that this one is not very easy to produce, maybe we could go on with the uh, proposal as is of actions. Um, yeah, I think we, we start discussing on a given on a GitHub issue, so I can uh, definitely try to to spend some some time uh, before the end of the week to. Um, to provide like a, a rough, rough idea. Thank you very much. And uh, Yanivar, uh, so I imagine that you want the actions to be added to the current document before we do a call for adoption, or are you willing to to adopt as is, and then we can continue discussing whether we put the actions in the same document or if we put it in a separate document, but you know, uh, move them along the track at the same pace. Uh, I, I would strongly prefer the same document. So because the actions, in my view, uh, address a concern with the, the identity part of the same API. Uh, I would be willing to do that if nobody else uh, raises too strong and uh, um, does not oppose too strongly. Yeah, my, my sense is that we are, with the call for adoption, we are agreeing to the scope of what the proposal is addressing, how it is split into documents, can evolve, will evolve over time. So I, I would personally agree with keeping them at one uh, as one document for now and iterate. OK, we have a path forward, I think. Awesome. And we're still ahead of time. Bernard, back to you. Yeah. Well, um, I think we're in the wrap-up phase. Um, so the question is, what uh, do we have a clear list of uh, things we need to follow up on? Um, I... So here I heard uh, the chairs to start a call for adoption for Capture Handle, uh, UN yes. to raise an issue on uh, a media session alternative to uh, the proposal. And I guess that's probably the gist of it. Um, well, we Ilad, can, can, can you pass the link to the GitHub issue? So that, that might be good to add to the, to, to the uh, um, log. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, what, uh, what link do you need? I'm sorry for uh, not paying attention. For um, a so the GitHub issue we discussed, uh, your proposal, the media session idea, and so on. Uh, that, that might be good to have that in the minutes. Uh, do you mean this? I've posted, posted it, in, pasted it in the chat, but uh, let me know if that no is not it. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's the one. That would be good to uh, if you if you want to refer to some action items that we are, I will probably uh, add some uh, um, some puts. Okay. And I've put the link in the minutes. Back to you, Bernard, then. Yeah, um, so the other things we have to do is uh, the announce the adoption of a first public working draft, right, for Media Capture Transform. I think that was another item. Um, or, or rather, send a call for consensus to others. Call for consensus, right, on, on the, right for that. Um, and any other any other immediate action items? Sorry, can you repeat the last one? A call for? Call for consensus on the on. adoption of the first public working draft of Media Capture Transform. Right. Uh, and we had summarized also uh, the work. So maybe we can get issue 71 done on that one. Right. right. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Harold committed to a pull request to remove the audio bits from the spec before right. we start that okay. CFC. OK. Um, and for the NV. Use case discussion. We, I think, had also a plan of uh, a team leading the work on the explainer and the uh, use right. case updates and the use uh, and uh, PRs. Okay, then I, I think we have our Did, uh, action items. Yeah. If somebody noted those down, um, it would be great to put them in the in the IRC because I'm I didn't. <laughs> you were talking faster than I can type. 
Uh, I'll take care of it, Tim. Brilliant. Thank you. OK. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. I think we've uh, actually completed all of the items for today. Um, our next meeting will be on uh, February 15th. See you then. Thank you, Joe. Bye-bye.